Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, good evening, depending on where you're located. Welcome to this virtual conversation about the history of denim. My name is Tara St. James, and I'm based in New York City. I'm the founder and creative director of a women's sustainable clothing label called Study New York. I am also a, a professor at F the Fashion Institute of Technology here in New York City, and I teach a class on sustainable textile sourcing in the sustainability certificate. My background in denim comes from very early stages when I started designing over 20 years ago and my start was in the denim industry. So I have a particular fondness for this subject. This is part of an ongoing series of public programs offered by the Brooklyn Historical Society, which has been a cultural hub for civic dialogue and community outreach for 155 years. Uh, today, I'm joined by a really impressive panel of experts who together will help me unpack the social, economic, and historical dimensions of denim. But before we dig in, a few little housekeeping. So I'd like to invite all of you who are listening to share your questions or comments. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see in the Q&A section a box um, and you can type in your questions. We will get to those in the second half of the program, which will last approximately an hour. Um, so if I would like to say hello to all three of our participants and our pa panelists. First, James Sullivan is the author of Jeans, A Cultural History of an American Icon. Welcome, James. Hi, Tara. Um, nice to see you. Great to see you. Uh, Emma McClendon is the Associate Curator of Costume at the Museum at FIT. Welcome, Emma. Thanks, Tara. And lastly, Otto von Busch is Associate Professor of Integrated Design at Parsons, also here in New York. Hi, Otto. Hello there. Thank you <laughs> for having me. <laughs> so welcome all. I'd like to give each of you a chance to say a few words about your history uh, and introduce yourselves to the audience so they get to know you better before we start our in-depth conversation about denim. Um, so I will start with James. Take it away. Okay. Uh, thanks again, Tara, um, and thanks to the Brooklyn Historical Society for doing this for us. Um, I am based in Boston, but um, I was actually born in Queens, uh, so it's nice to uh, be back in Brooklyn, however, virtually. Um, so what I'm going to do is, well, I'll tell you a little bit about myself first, and can we get the first slide, please? Um, Again, the title of my book is Jeans, A Cultural History of an American Icon. Um, I wrote it a little over a decade ago. Um, I am an author, nonfiction author. I've written several books at this point. This was my first, so it's my baby. Um, the, uh, uh, my other books are on a variety of subjects. Um, as I like to describe them without listing them all off, uh, I, I, my subjects are uh, comedy, music, sports, and pants. Um, I am a longtime contributor to the Boston Globe on a variety of subjects. Prior to that, I spent about 10 years in San Francisco where I was a staff uh, pop music critic um, and culture critic at the San Francisco Chronicle. And I've also been a, uh, an editor for Rolling Stone among other freelance gigs. I'm also uh, the program director of a documentary film festival here north of Boston, where I live. And I'm one of the founders of uh, an annual literary event called Lit Crawl Boston. Um, if we could get the second slide, that would be great. So what I'm hoping to do for the next few minutes is kind of take us all on a bit of a mad dash through the popular history of uh, blue jeans in, in American culture and global culture. Um, Many of you tuning in are probably familiar with some version of the story that Levi Strauss and company is supposedly the first uh, major company to mass produce blue jeans beginning in 1873. Um, that is, is, is not necessarily true. What we know about the history of blue jeans and denim is that they, the, 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 the garment goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years prior um, to the mass production of it. Um, the peasants, uh, working class people around the globe have been wearing indigo dyed um, clothing, work clothes for thousands of years, and at least for hundreds of years before the mass manufacture of this quote unquote American product, 
uh, sort of the field workers and then the uh, workers in the uh, during the Industrial Revolution um, in Europe were also wearing blue dyed rough you know canvas or other types of fabric very similar to jean material. Um, the Le Levi Strauss story uh, comes in because Levi sort of as the, the the major name that everyone recognizes um, you know to the to the victor go to the go the spoil sort of story. Um, Levi Strauss uh, obviously became the biggest name in blue jeans beginning in the late uh, 19th century. Um, this picture here that we're looking at I love. Um, this is an example of one of the many competitors that Levi Strauss had. Nope, that one, yep. <laughs> um, uh, in the 1870s, this was actually a New York company, upstate New York in the town of Wappingers Falls um, called Sweetor. And this brand um, became somewhat well known, well, became very well known around the New York region. What um, was the case in those years was that Levi Strauss and many other companies were all regional. The, the distribution um, around the country had not gotten to the point yet where any mass produced products were really able to um, be shipped around the country in a timely manner. So really most of the companies were more regional in nature. Sweet Ore was sort of the, the, the Levi uh, equivalent in New York state. And by the 1920s or so, um, from my research, um, I gathered that many, if not most of the construction workers who were building during the boom age of the 1920s in New York City were wearing, if they were wearing some kind of jeans, they were probably wearing Sweet Ore. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, uh, the, this tag here says that the Sweet Ore was established in 1871. Um, they might may have been the first company to use this idea of a tug of war, showing how durable their product was. Um, Levi started using, I think Sweetor started using this image in 1880. And in the 1880s, uh, Levi Strauss started using an image that's still on the back of your jeans if you're wearing a pair of Levi's, um, known as the two horse brand, two horses trying to tear apart a pair of Levi's and uh, you know, hopefully failing to do so. But there were lots of examples of this um, um, around the regional companies producing blue jeans in the late 19th century. There were uh, there were bulldogs and there were trains trying to pull apart a pair of pants. So it was kind of a copycat um, as so much of the fashion industry is. It was kind of a copycat situation. Um, we, uh, I, I failed to mention a minute ago, but should have that um, when I was talking about the working class people of Europe, um, one of the interesting points about the history of denim and blue jeans is that the names themselves come not from America, but from Europe. Uh, an early version of uh, blue work pants were being used with by, by um, recycling, repurposing um, used sailcloth from the ports, uh, the ship, shipping ports of Italy. And so around Europe, um, those sailcloth pants um, became known as les gènes because the, the port city of Genoa, Italy, uh, to, to those people uh, from that city, the French called them les gènes. And then a little bit later during the industrial revolution, uh, the, the town of Nîmes, France, um, was one of the major textile manufacturing centers. And the uh, denim, the heavy duty denim product uh, that was mass produced there um, became known as Serge de Nîmes, which um, gives us the term denim. Uh, Levi Strauss, I'll just uh, quickly note, um, did in fact start mass producing jeans in 1873. And some of you may be aware that the story why Levi gets to say that they invented blue jeans was that they invented the specific style that we recognize today, which is the rivets, the riveted blue jeans. Um, homespun blue jeans that were being used during the California gold rush, et cetera, um, earlier in the 19th century were, um, had a real problem with staying together at the seams, especially in the pockets. Gold miners would be stuffing their pockets with nuggets of gold and um, having them bust open. And so what ended up happening, long story short, was that a, a, a tailor in Reno, Nevada, uh, right near the heart of the gold, the gold rush, named Jacob Davis, um, 
started using rivets from horse blankets on the jeans at the pressure points to keep them uh, intact, keep the seams intact. He brought his idea to Levi Strauss, who was a, a, whole, a, a was a was a, a goods uh, distributor who sold denim to Davis, among other tailors. And they combined, they pulled the resources. Levi paid for the uh, patent application, and together they created the denim, uh, the, the the blue jeans using denim rivets that we recognize today as um, the uh, you know the blue jean that we we all understand. So if we could have the next slide, please, that'd be great. Uh, so this, of course, is John Wayne. Um, by the early 20th century, blue jeans started to move, at least in fits and starts, outside of the realm of workwear and into the realm of something approaching fashion. Um, a major part of this was the Hollywood film industry uh, where the uh, Western films were one of the biggest, uh, one of the most popular genres of the early 20th century. And stars like John Wayne wanted to look as authentic as they could, looking like cowboys. So they started wearing jeans like this. There's a great story that um, John Wayne's son once told about how every time his father uh, got another part on another Western film, before he went on the shoot, he would take the family out to Catalina Island uh, off the coast of Southern California for a, a quick vacation, family vacation. He would buy a brand new pair of jeans, um, bring them out. Uh, at the time, jeans were um, uh, shrink to fit, um, not pre-washed. Um, so what you did was you bought a pair of jeans and you soaked them some way or another. A lot of people actually sat down in a river to shrink their jeans to uh, fit their bodies. And what John Wayne did was um, he would take his brand new pair of jeans that he was going to wear on the set of his next movie, um, dunk them off, the, tie them to a rope, um, dunk them off the pier in uh, on Catalina Island with a, with a bunch of rocks in the pockets so that they would stay submerged. And then at the end of the stay, he would pull them out and dry them off and have a nicely weathered new pair of jeans to wear to um, his next film. So. Um, by the early 20th century, Levi Strauss, the, the, the competition was sort of consolidating. There were a whole bunch of West Coast brands in particular um, with great names like Can't Bustum, the Boss brand, that were probably equally um, competitive with Levi Strauss towards the end of the 19th century. But by the early 20th century, Levi was sort of starting to consolidate uh, its hold on the industry and starting to find out, how, figure out how to uh, distribute across the country. Um, at the same time, the uh, suburbanization of America was going on and we were sort of watching the um, final frontier out west that the, the, the Western frontier was sort of closing off. You know, it's California and the Western states were being suburbanized. And so people had this nostalgia for um, a, 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 a recently past era of um, the, the quote unquote wild west, which was, which was passing and becoming suburbanized. So people had a real nostalgia for cowboy culture. And that's partly why the Western films, that's probably mostly why the Western films did so well with audiences. Um, across the country, a few other regional brands became uh, almost if not as well known as Levi's, uh, among them Lee jeans, which uh, started up in the Midwest in uh, around 1910, 1911. And then a brand called Bluebell, uh, which was in the Carolinas. Uh, and um, Bluebell eventually uh, sort of resurrected a brand called Wrangler, which became its signature product beginning in the uh, 1940s. And those are the three big jeans brands that we still recognize today as, you know, sort of work, workwear jeans. Um, one, one other point I'll make on this slide is that one of the major ways that blue jeans came east um, was the idea of dude ranches. I mentioned the closing of the... Uh, American West. And when cattle ranchers uh, and others, you know, farmers in the West started realizing that their business was um, falling off, many of them by the 1930s were starting to repurpose their farms by inviting well to do Easterners West to come spend a healthy week on a dude ranch. So dude ranchers became very popular as a destination for, again, the well to do classes, especially of the Eastern. Uh, uh, seaboard and uh, women in particular really took to the idea of going out west 
getting some fresh air for a week, riding horses. And they loved the jeans that the, uh, that the ranch hands were wearing and they started bringing them back. And so that's sort of the first inkling that uh, in the 1920s and 30s, um, the mainstream America and the middle class were taking to the idea that blue jeans could be worn for something other than workwear. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. So this is a picture from the 1950s, obviously. I don't know that I really needed to caption it. Um, it seems pretty obvious, but um, this just shows uh, the idea that teenagers by the 1950s, well, the, the, the point that I wanna make here is that teenagers were really not even a thing necessarily until after World War II. Um, prior to the Second World War, uh, young people in their teens were either still in school or if they were done with high school, they weren't necessarily going to college, they were going to work. And if they were going to work, they were probably taking jobs and contributing to the, the pooled family income. After World War II, we saw a real boom in the American economy. We saw that suburbanization that I was talking about. And one of the um, big results of this switch um, in the culture was that young people, teenagers, began to have uh, a, a sort of freedom um, and lives of their own that they had never had before. They had some disposable income. They were able to go to you know sock hops and diners with each other. Some of them started getting their own cars, um, taking off, not necessarily sticking around the house, not necessarily working on behalf of the, the, the family. And many of them had grown up with those Western films that I spoke of and sort of howdy doody and um, their parents ordering uh, little cowboy costumes from them from the uh, Sears and uh, Sears and Roebuck and uh, Montgomery Ward catalogs in the 1930s and 40s. And as they got older, as they entered adulthood, they sort of decided, well, you know what, I like wearing these jeans. They make us feel like we're a generation um, um, united. And this is another big step in jeans becoming part of the culture outside of just being utilitarian workwear. Um, among other things, uh, the Rosie the Riveter phenomenon of women going to work in the factories during World War II introduced many more women to the idea that denim uh, chore coats and jeans could be something they might be interested in wearing. And by the later 1940s, uh, Life Magazine, among others, was um, running features on the idea that when young women were wearing their boyfriend's jeans um, and they called it, they actually gave it a name, the boyfriend look, you know, so they had great pictures in Life magazine um, of young women wearing jeans that look like these that were a little too big for them, but, um, but you know, it was sort of a sign of uh, that you were paired off with, with, with a guy. Um, obviously, I don't have a picture of them here, but, uh, but obviously a big part of the culture in these years was um, uh, Holly, more Hollywood figures like Marlon Brando in The Wild One, uh, The Wild Ones about motorcycle culture, James Dean, uh, Elvis Presley, um, things that uh, most of our viewers will recognize as, uh, you know, sort of icons of uh, jeans wearing culture. One of the interesting things about the period was that for a time, parents really got down on jeans. Um, if you look again at this picture, um, parents started to believe that jeans were a mark of the quote unquote bad kids. Um, looks like these, these kids are being hauled in to uh, answer some questions that they don't necessarily want to answer or whatever. But um, parents were uh, uh, starting to become concerned that if their kids wore jeans that they would be labeled as the bad kids. And so interestingly, the cotton industry um, put together some um, sort of PR marketing uh, whizzes to form something called the Denim Council. And the Denim Council began running, running ads on behalf of the cotton industry and the jeans businesses, the, the, the blue jeans manufacturers, to sort of say, you know what, moms, uh, dads, mostly moms in the 1950s, um, among other things, if your kids are wearing jeans, they're easier to, to wash, they're easier to take care of. They're, so, you know, your laundry problems will um, stay down, st you know, you'll minimize your laundry problems. So tell the kids to change into their jeans when they come home from school. And the campaign worked. And by 1961, uh, John F. Kennedy's Peace Corps, when that was first established, um, was outfitted by uh, blue jeans and by the Denim Council. So the good kids in the Peace Corps were wearing blue jeans. And so that campaign worked. Just a couple more quick slides, if we could go to the next one. So another, you know, pretty, I mean, not this one 
specifically, but a pretty familiar image from the era. Just, uh, you know, kids at um, rock and roll festivals during the hippie era. Um, by the 1960s, blue jeans had become so commonly understood as leisure wear and not just work wear that uh, certain manufacturers started, uh, well, certain individuals like these guys started wearing them, you know, either just letting them become completely ratty and, and, and torn or certain manufacturers started uh, fiddling with the, the basic uh, uh, outline of, of a pair of blue, of a classic pair of blue jeans um, to get a, le a leg up, <laughs> no pun, I guess pun intended. Um, uh, on the competition. So one of the interesting things that during this period, we can't tell from this picture, but um, the sort of age old idea that, that, that uh, Navy um, men and women wore bell bottoms became adopted, um, adapted by the blue jean industry. Um, Navy men wore bell bottoms because they were easy to roll up. Um, and if you were swabbing the deck or water was rushing over the deck of your ship, um, it was easy to roll your pants up. Simple as that. But um, by the 1960s, we're all familiar with pictures of um, hippie kids wearing bell bottoms. Um, at this point, um, blue jeans started to become what I like to call the, the blank canvas. I mean, denim itself is, is, is um, very much similar to canvas. And every subsequent generation after the, these hippie kids um, f have found a way to take a product that by now their own parents were wearing and change them up in some fashion to make them their own. So the gener the, each, each subsequent generation has a way of um, taking this by now classic product and uh, messing with it um, so that it, uh, it becomes their own. Um, by uh, 1975, uh, to, just to give a, a quick example of how big the industry had become, Levi Strauss and company became the first denim business to uh, top a billion dollars in sales, which was an enormous amount of money uh, 45 years ago. And a year and a half later, uh, Jimmy Car when Jimmy Carter was being inaugurated as president, his son Chip famously wore a denim tuxedo to the inauguration balls. Um, so a lot happened with the industry in uh, within a decade or two from those kids, uh, you know, standing at the, at the police station um, in the 1950s. Um, one more slide and then I will uh, hand it over. So this slide is going to kind of stand in for a whirlwind tour from the late 70s up to basically the present day. Um, by the 1970s, there were a number of sort of hippie boutique uh, boutiques opening up that were looking to sell to that generation of young people. And as I mentioned the bell bottoms. Um, one of the uh, phenomena that, that piped up, popped up at that time was the idea that quote unquote French jeans were better than American ones. Um, there were brands with, uh, you know, sort of fancy stitching and, you know, uh, logos that were more than just, uh, a, you know, a classic uh, Lee or Wrangler look on the back pocket. Um, brands such as Britannia, um, one called McKean that was not, was, uh, was, was not made in, in, in England, but very much looked like it was. So there was this idea that the American uh, youth suddenly wanted French or European looking jeans. And that led to the era that we all know as the designer jeans era. Um, among other things, uh, um, well, one of the first signposts of that in the late 1970s, early 80s was that there was one major player in the, in the ready to wear industry that really wanted to get into to kind of take the place of these boutiques that were creating uh, French jeans. And um, so this, this manufacturer first approached Pierre Cardin who declined then uh, this one marketing person in particular got the idea of approaching someone uh, who he considered to be a kind of American royalty. He approached Jackie Onassis. She, he wanted someone's name on the back of the jeans to make it seem like you were, you were wearing a status symbol. And uh, after Jackie O uh, also declined, then he approached Gloria Vanderbilt, um, heir to the Vanderbilt millions and or billions uh, and, um, uh, you know, mother of uh, Anderson Cooper. And so uh, Gloria Vanderbilt agreed and her jeans, the Vanderbilt jeans became one of the first examples of 
designer genes. Um, Calvin Klein, um, and into the 80s and 90s, Jordache, guest genes, we saw stonewash and acid wash and all kinds of, uh, you know, permutations of the product. Um, uh, and then this picture kind of brings us almost up to the present day, 1990s. Um, the Brooklyn um, uh, hip hop uh, streetwear designer, Carl Canai, um, kind of helped push the idea of baggy jeans um, in the culture. And, um, and then, uh, you know, after the um, turn of the 2000s, we had the skinny jean phenomenon, um, which Brooklynites are fairly familiar with, I believe. Um, and that kind of takes us up to the present day. So I hope that was um, useful um, and uh, not quite as wordy as I usually am, although I'm afraid it was. <laughs> hope you enjoyed it and uh, um, back to Tara. Thanks, James. That was really informational. So much to learn. And I'm, it brings me back to my earlier days of designing denim and mm. having to compete with the French and Italian manufacturers like Gerbeau at the time, who were really popular here in the United States. Um, I'm going to pass the torch to Emma now, because I think um, your presentation was a perfect segue into what she wants to talk about. So Emma, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. OK, great. Um, I will just ask for the slides to be pulled up. Um, I am coming at this topic from the perspective of a museum curator. As Tara said at the beginning, I am the associate curator at the museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology. And in 2015, I organized an exhibition that was called Denim Fashion's Frontier, which looked at a lot of the history that James just spoke about uh, going from the 19th century to the present, but it also expanded on some of those images and particularly on jeans. Um, it went beyond jeans to look at all different types of denim garments. So if we want to go to the next slide, there's some images of objects. So some of the objects, sorry, I'm some of the images might have gotten a little distorted, um, but the a main kind of crux of what I do at the museum is really looking at objects first and foremost and trying to weave and understand the narrative of cultural history that we're so familiar with and see how that plays out in the actual objects that we have in front of us. So what can we glean from how these objects are made? What has survived? What do they tell us? And what I was really struck by when I started organizing this exhibition was how prevalent women actually are in this history of denim. That it's not just the five pocket blue jean that we're so familiar with, but speaking towards what James was talking about with that earlier history of pre-Levi's denim, we see this 19th century women's workwear jacket that would have been you know, made by hand, would have been made at home, would have probably been made by the wearer. And that is obviously a workwear garment, but that is also adhering to the silhouette of fashion at the time in the way that it nips in at the waist, in the way that there's tucks, that there's gathers to sort of shape the sleeve. So it was interesting to me to see also how the history of denim as workwear and the history of denim as a fashion textile kind of exist side by side in a way that might not be as familiar to us. So in the center, we have an image that was shot for Vogue in the 1940s that show designs by Claire McCardle, who was an incredibly prominent sportswear designer of the period, where these are day wear looks that are using denim. And similarly, just next to it are pieces from the museum at FIT's collection that are also by McCardle, also from the 40s, but are from a category that would have been designated at the time play clothes. So what this means are, clothes that you would wear to go to the beach, to have a picnic, to sort of engage in recreational activities. And as we can see, these have nothing to do with quote unquote workwear or even 
you know, the genes at all. They're absolutely sort of in line with a fashion vocabulary. Uh, next slide, please. And then kind of coming up to today, um, obviously, uh, as James took us through that fabulous kind of history, you know, there really is a sweeping moment of change where jeans and denim really just go mainstream as we get into the 1970s. And you start to see a whole range of high end products begin to be made out of the material. And that has really kind of remained up to today where we see different periods where denim might be more on trend than other periods. But overall, over the last three, four decades, you really see designers at a very high level playing with the textile. And what I found interesting about that is two things. You know, one, which we can see, I think, very clearly from these images, particularly the image on the right, which is from a recent Dior runway show, Denim, because of its extreme cultural associations, has become a shorthand for a particular period in time, a way for designers to very obviously reference a source of inspiration, to make it clear that they're looking to the 70s, they're looking to the 60s, they're looking to sort of Rosie the Riveter, they're showing this kind of nostalgia in their collections. And on the image on the left, this is from a collection Junya Watanabe, the Japanese designer did, where he made a series of these incredibly dramatic garments that are all actually constructed from pre-worn pairs of jeans. And this is a fascinating collection for me because what we see is I think a kind of fusion of two periods in denim's history. It, in a way, it kind of harkens back to the 19th century to almost that woman's workwear jacket in its silhouette and the way that he's kind of constructed the bodice in these kind of sweeping lines that almost echo boning and construction of that period. But also it's very clearly an homage to the counterculture of the hippies, kind of taking pre-worn jeans, reworking them, making them your own and having the kind of frayed edges and those elements of kind of worn down denim as a very, you know, conscious, decorative and personalized element of the garment. Uh, and, and just before moving on, um, the last thing I want to mention here is I think denim's appearance on the runway is also very interesting in terms of the reaction that it gets. You know, despite the fact that it has come back again and again on the runway for, you know, 40 plus years, we still see a consumers being kind of uncomfortable with it. You know, reporters, you know, react, consumer reactions, not knowing really what to make of Dior selling jeans. You know, is this okay? Is denim really luxury? What this kind of question of, is it worth that? And, and I find this interesting because I think it points to a, a, a continuing sort of bias and association with denim, uh, connecting it to that original application as a quote unquote workwear working class garment and exposing our relationship with fashion and the runway as a space for aspiration. You know, we, we don't necessarily balk at Dior or whomever doing exact copies of military uniforms or garments, you know, a naval pea coat, you know, a combat jacket, something like that. But the jeans, denim, it conjures up all sorts of, you know, reactions that I think show that we're still a little uncomfortable with it as aspirational wear that I find interesting. Um, and then I'll conclude with one last slide. Um, this next slide is, is pointing to a, a more recent exhibition that I just organized that opened in December and unfortunately had to go on hiatus because of the um, current events of the pandemic. 
Um, but this exhibition was called Power Mode, uh, The Force of Fashion. And it looked at the relation be relationship between fashion and clothing objects and power dynamics. And obviously denim appeared really throughout. And, and in part, you know, a big section looking at denim was again, the hippies. And we see these, you know, thinking about the objects, this great example of shorts that have been hand embroidered, personalized. They come from this period that James spoke about but, and, and these we know and we recognize denim as this sort of fabric of rebellion, right? That sort of giving the wearer a certain type of authority that is, um, or a certain type of power that's subversive and sort of going against established authority. But also in the exhibition is this ensemble that's in the center, which is made out of gray denim and it's a prisoner uniform from Auburn State Prison in upstate New York. And it's from 1913. And so here we see denim working in a complete opposite way where it is taking power away from the wearer. You know, it's highlighting their subordinate position and making them into a group that is all sort of under the authority of the prison system. And of course, this connects to the kind of power dynamic of denim as workwear that we see it sort of elevated in certain respects and this legacy of denim as a workwear kind of a, being celebrated as heritage, but then also a way in which denim as workwear historically for so long and even still today and how uncomfortable we can be with it is still has a complex power dynamic that isn't just giving authority. And, and the piece in the middle I think is in, I have it in the exhibition displayed next to the piece that's on the right, um, which is a white denim suit by emerging designer Joy Mary Douglas from a project she did called Rebranded uh, in 2017. Uh, for this project, Joy worked with previously incarcerated individuals to use clothing, um, in this case, uh, a denim suit to reclaim sort of, you know, reframe, rebrand pejorative words like convict, thug, public enemy through design and through clothing. And so here she's created a white suit out of denim, which, you know, of course is connecting back to that legacy of denim as a prisoner uniform. And also it's a white denim. So that's connecting to and a white suit on a woman's body and it's you know, connecting to the legacy of the suffragette movement and women's rights. And here it has been deconstructed and reconstructed with these panels that spell out the word convict across them. And this was really interesting to me as this sort of you know, triptych because we see how the fabric kind of flows and evolves through these different histories where we have a piece at the end where this is absolutely fashion as protest and fashion as rebellion but it's also connecting back to the history of denim and as a textile that's complicated and that can take away power almost just as easily as it can give power. So that sort of you know, gives you an overview of kind of how I'm thinking about, about denim as a textile, as a tool for fashion and, and really, uh, an exploration that's rooted in objects and what objects can tell us about culture and, and dynamics and social dynamics in our culture. So I'll hand it back over to Tara. Thank you, Emma. I have uh, one follow-up for you and I'm really yeah. glad that you brought up those last um, three looks because I think most people uh, who are maybe don't have textile or design backgrounds wouldn't identify the gray denim right. or the natural <laughs> denim as denim. Uh, we tend to think of it as the blue fabric mm -hmm. that we all know um, used in five pocket jeans traditionally. Can you speak a little bit about why blue is the most ubiquitous of denim? And if that's the only version of the textile that is not really accepted, because I want to touch on your point of, of it still being controversial on the high fashion runways. Mm -hmm. um, is it really just the blue version of this fabric that is not that widely accepted? 
Yeah, I think it really is the blue that we've come to just associate with denim. You know, that's what we recognize as denim. That's what people t mean most of the time when they're talking about this history and talking about jeans. They're, the image that conjures in most people's minds is of a blue textile. But obviously from what we saw and, you know, from the history James talks about, denim as a textile is, number one, it can come in a lot of different colors. You know, even if you go out on the market today, you'll see denim in black in gray and, you know, white, all sorts of colors. But it also, its history and its definition as a textile, I find to be a little slippery, you know, because the way people want to define it, like if someone asks you and someone talks about denim and talks about this history, they're really referring to a blue dyed, warp face twill weave fabric that's made out of cotton entirely and at least historically made out of cotton entirely and that's dyed in a very particular way a process typically called rope dyeing that means that through this process the indigo dye is kind of coated onto the threads of the cotton through a process of kind of dipping and then airing it out and then dipping it again so that you can get a lighter or darker color depending on how many times you do it. But the core of the fabric, the core of the thread, I mean, always remains white. That's why as you wear it, as you brush your hands on your jeans, as you, you know, sit down, get up, what have you, that blue color starts to wear away and it starts to fade. Um, and, and so those have always been the kind of defining features. But as we know, you know, denim is no longer only cotton. There's tons of stretch. We mentioned skinny jeans, you know, that's not possible without all that stretch. They come in countless colors. Historically, they also did come in countless colors. It's really, I think, James's point sort of to the victor goes the spoils, you know, Levi's made blue jeans. Um, and, and I'm sure James can speak to this history a lot more about sort of the color and everything because there's a lot of nuances to it. Um, but uh, in my opinion, it's a lot to do with Levi's and how Levi's became the sort of supreme um, uh, figure in, in this market. Um, but just, you know, another point kind of about the color. I mean, one brand I think that's really interesting in this space and we haven't really mentioned, I know Otto will go into this a bit, is that um, obviously the manufacturers and who we're talking about are very far afield and Japan is incredibly important for contemporary denim. And one, one of the most interesting pieces in terms of the textile that I acquired for this exhibition that I did was from a Japanese brand called Capital with a K who are really interesting brand. If you're a big denim head, denim fan, you know, look up Capital. They created at the time, they had just sort of unveiled this fabric that they called century denim. And I got a pair of jeans made out of it. And, you know, from far away, like if you don't know about textiles, like they look like jeans and they look like they're made out of denim. They're, they're kind of like grayish blue. They feel like denim. If you get up close and you look at the textile, you'll realize they're not denim at all. They are actually canvas. So they're not a warp face twill. They're a canvas material that has a running stitch of cotton threads in a slightly darker indigo dyed color running across the whole length of the fabric. And this is a traditional uh, technique developed during the Edo period in Japan called sheshiko, where it was to reinforce the fabric to kind of make it stronger, but they'd also do decorative elements. So it looks and it acts like denim, but it's not like you couldn't actually define it as denim. Also, it's dyed in a in another traditional method where the color is kind of painted on. So it acts, all, and this is again meant to strengthen the fabric, but just like the rope dyed denim, it's going to fade over time. So it, it was fascinating to me to see that in the way people are playing with this, the nature of denim and what denim is. Sorry, kind of a long-winded answer. No, that's great. <laughs> you touched on so many points that I wanted to address, so that's fantastic. Otto, hope you're ready. I'm gonna pass it on to you. 
Yes, hello. Yes, thank you for, for having me. Um, so I teach uh, integrated design at Parsons and um, a fair amount of my classes are centering around fashion. And um, I guess I often have to take the role in the sense of, of you know, how do we clean up the act of, of uh, the fallout of fashion, if you want to say so, on, on a sort of uh, on a global scale, if you want to say so. I mean, how our students are feeding this industry that many know are, are one of the big polluters. And, um, and denim is, of course, part of this. I mean, I made just one slide and I was just going to show some or talk about some statistics and things. But actually, we can also get over that because we're running out of time and we don't have to have all that kind of doom and gloom going on. But I think it's just interesting perhaps for us to, to think just, you know, that the you know, harvesting of, of cotton, I mean, as many know, is takes a lot of water, for example, and all of that. And, you know, it's engaging in, you know, if you go to Central Asia, there's slave, slave or child labor that, you know, for harvesting the, the cotton and so on. And I mean, just to sort of set in proportion, a pound of cotton requires as much, um, water as a hundred pounds of tomatoes. So it just sort of sets in a sense also, you know, food production versus cotton production in, in proportion in a sense to, to what consumerism is doing on the planet and us. Uh, I should, perhaps we should look at the slide I'm having. Um, it, it is sort of, I just found this image that I put at the center because I thought it was a fun way of just sort of introducing these, you know, uh, distressed genes that have been, you know, coming in and out of fashion for a long time. But I thought this was an interesting Turkish brand that I sort of haven't encountered before, but exactly that they're having this kind of biohazard sort of lining to them that perhaps sort of shows a little bit of also, you know, what is under the surface of denim when we start scratching it, if you want to say so. And of course, we know already of the, a lot of the pollution and we know a lot of the working conditions and of course, the the, uh, the labor issues that and, and labor hazards that comes with distressing and acid washing, stone washing, and so on. You know, and 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 in a sense, that I think the irony of a lot of this is when it comes to consumerism is that uh, a lot of brands and a lot of hope when we come to cleaning up the industry comes from you know transparency or making people aware of of all these dangers and and you know so fashion revolution and others of trying to sort of put a face on. The people who actually produce our clothes and so on. I, and this is, of course, really important that we try to have this approach to, to getting sort of active on trying to, you know, mitigate all the problems with, with um, overconsumption, if you want to say so. But at the same time, we also know the troubles of transparency and the troubles of actually changing our behaviors. You know, most of us know that sugar is not good for us. Most of us know that smoking, etc. You know, so, and, and most of, you know, we, we still continue doing bad bad stuff in the world and and not necessarily is that what's going to change the industry um, at the same time i think it, that you know what denim does show a lot is sort of around coming back to the questions of power and i think emma's pointing out the japanese brand capital it's also the ir irony of that it is a sort of a labor wear and also you know prison wear that to so many people across the whole planet, in the connection with American culture, jeans is a garment of sort of tapping into American popular culture. It is something that was so much sold as the garment of capitalism. You know, it is the worker garment, but if you go to just Eastern Europe or something like that, you know, getting a pair of American jeans were worth, you know, the, you know, the value of labor, <laughs> labor garment from the world of capital is so, you know, so there's something ironic about the way that, that, that fashion has sort of traveled and is this garment of sort of a democratization of fashion that we now can buy at H&M for like $20, $15 and so on. And, and of course, you know, if you go to Walmart and perhaps, you know, what we see on the, on the street in the brands is really the tip of the iceberg in gene production, gene consumption. You know, go to Walmart and look at the volumes for $10, $10 jeans. And so no wonder Americans buy, I mean, in 2018, it was still four pairs of jeans a year. And then this is of a sturdy work garment that, of course, you know, with the fashion is being distressed in popular ways, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and, and um, so it doesn't necessarily last much longer. Uh, but also, you know, it is also hard to recycle. You know, it's, it's 
exactly if we could, it's got studs, it's a material that perhaps is already destroyed in many ways. So it's really hard to actually find the pieces to put into recycling collections, etc. So, so there's a lot of sort of troubles when we try to sort of clean up in a sense, the, the denim, the world of denim and the world of jeans. Uh, and this was also really highlighted to me when I visited a, a research project in Colorado where they have been going through the recycling industry in the, uh, um, there and, and exactly where were different used garments going that were sort of coming from Goodwill and so on. And it was everything from, you know, uh, that there is a market for after Halloween, you know, after Halloween, the recycling bills are stuffed with Halloween costumes, you know, but there is a market for them going down to the carnivals in Brazil and so on, you know, so there's a market for a lot of used garments that perhaps we think are only used once, but actually have a huge market, except perhaps American jeans, because American sizes are just not fitting many people across the planet. So the American jeans are actually in a very large extent, unfortunately, going to the dumps rather than being dumped even overseas to, to sort of wipe out markets over there. But uh, that was just a bit crash into the troubles of, of denim and the troubles that come with what we want to say sort of the democratization of fashion and, and this is a big of the of the conundrum that we're trying to deal with in many of the classes is uh, and at Parsons, for example, is, you know, that uh, as, as one student, you know, very accurately put it in a sense, you know, the problem of sustainability is that poor people consume. And in a sense, that's unfortunate, you know, side of democratization of fashion is that what has happened is that when, you know, uh, poorer people across the planet are replicating the behaviors of the rich and the rich West, you know, that's when the, the, the problem really starts appearing. And what we usually, the classical sort of approach we have in sustainability is to teach austerity to the poor and tell them you shouldn't be go shopping at, at Black Friday. You shouldn't be going to the, you know, the fast fashion stores. You shouldn't be doing this consumer behaviors to the classes that perhaps in the most extent are actually using fashion as for social mobility and for the possibility of rewarding themselves on the Friday after working their boring jobs where they have very little opportunities of changing their lives and clothes become such an avenue for huge groups in the social lower classes to feel that they're in control of their lives. And we are the ones then that start blaming them for, you know, for embra embracing the opportunity that fashion does. And instead we sort of teach, tell them that they should stop consuming at the same time as we celebrate and have the walking closets of, of or et cetera, Met Galas, et cetera, et cetera. So that, you know, it just sort of shows in a sense of how denim and jeans is really at the epicenter of class struggle and globalization and really at this sort of extreme juncture of what happens when Western consumer behaviors and sort of the liberties of American capitalism and freedom and, and resistance to this, you know, also becomes a, a global consumer object that really sort of tears into the, the you know, environmentalism and, and the real impact across the whole planet. Oh, that was the short version. All right, okay. Thanks, Otto. I know that they're slightly unpleasant, but I think it's so important to bring up all these points about the environmental and social lack of sustainability of this product, but of the fashion industry in general. Um, I have one question for you, because you mentioned that uh, the larger American sizes, I'm presuming you meant the larger American sizes uh, of denim are not resellable in other countries. Um, but with the durability of most denim fabrics, I won't say all because some are, are, are not so durable, but the, the traditional denim fabric um, in a larger size tends to be very coveted, coveted by some upcycling designers who are looking for more material in, in, their, in their use. Are you seeing uh, students now that they're more interested in sustainability, I'm making the presumption that the students are more interested in sustainability because that's been my experience. Um, but are you seeing them gravitate towards uh, post-consumer upcycling as a design strategy as being acceptable? And I'll point to an example that Emma gave us with the, I think it was Junior Watanabe's uh, dress being upcycled from post-consumer. Um, you, are you seeing this in, in your work with students as well? I mean, in, in one sense, yes. I mean, in one sense, there's definitely an interest. And, and, of, and of course, the, the beauty of, of denim steel is that, you know, it, it does often produce interesting patina, 
you know, it, it, is a, it is a fabric that, that we often recognize for its patina and, and, and that dealing with this patina is an extremely rewarding type of, 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 of feedback that very few fabrics, in a sense, give us the same type of, of, um, of um, um, sensibilities in that sense too. At the same time, it is also, you know, for the students who sit and work with the machine, it is a hard work fabric. You know, it is hard to recycle, it's hard to sort of cut up, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so, so there is some sort of, it is a, it's not always the sort of intuitive in, in I mean, and, and easily accessible in that sense to actually start working with and doing, doing a whole collection of in that sense. At the same time, I, I think what I see more and more is students that want to think larger in the whole culture of wearing and the culture of being in clothes. And I think that is something that is also changing more and more where students really want to look at, well, how does repair work? How do we promote repair? How do we, how, how does a brand look like that actually actively engages with, with consumers to, to encourage repair? And I think we see that more and more across the whole market where, you know, I mean, repairing services are emerging in many brands and so on. And I think that's also where, of course, the reward of denim is exactly this, that it's something that can age beautifully and it can, it's acceptable to have visible repairs that many other fabrics are not really, um, getting away with if you want to say so you know so I, I think that's also with the sort of romanticism that sort of emerges out of denim there is also um it it, uh, it can actually act as a sort of a training ground for the culture of care that we may not have with many other types of garment that we actually are encouraged to sit and repair and try out and fumble on and our first sort of repairs on a sewing machine but with denim you know that it can still work so i think you know thinking of it like that i have a fair amount of students that really wants to see how we can change our behavior with clothes and how clothes can actually be in a sense a sort of a training ground for a more careful way of being with clothes than just exactly the material aspects of it in that sense Okay, so I want to bring this conversation back to everyone now because you've all touched on one point that I think is really important to note, which is denim being synonymous with the American icon and being known as an American product, even though we've seen that it, it isn't necessarily either manufactured here and certainly doesn't have its origins here in the United States. Um, but most jeans that are currently worn, while well, originally they were hyper local produced, as uh, James mentioned, most jeans that are currently on the market are not manufactured here. Um, now, especially that we're seeing issues with supply chain because of this pandemic, do you feel that uh, the reshoring of American denim manufacturing is possible? Uh, if not, why not? And how do you feel that this could impact uh, both the fashion industry and then manufacturing in the United States? Anyone can jump in. Anyone? I, anyone? I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll just say briefly that I don't, I, I don't think the reshoring of anything is going to be happening anytime soon. Um, Cone Denim is a, a well-known um, denim plant that for decades in uh, North Carolina that for decades made uh, the denim that Levi Strauss used. Um, it effectively went out of business a few decades ago, kind of got resurrected for a decade or so by selling, you know, the the quality don't cone product to smaller, more boutique uh, jeans makers, and has subsequently effectively gone out of business again. Um, I've heard recently that there are people trying to revive it once again, but they are, you know, absolutely the exception to the rule. Um, in much the same way that jeans manufacturers like Levi's and Lee and Wrangler kind of led the way towards um, telling a story about their product um, and selling it on those terms. They also kind of led the way to offshoring, to sending the business overseas because it was cheaper for manufacturing overseas. And again, I, don't, I personally don't think that very many industries are coming back in any significant numbers uh, anytime soon to America. Anyone wanna, else wanna address that? I, I agree with James. I mean, I was with your question immediately thought of Cone as you know a recent example of the kind of troubles facing 
domestic denim production. Um, but I think I'd, I'd be particularly interested to hear, if, you know, Otto has any insights on this just because you, um, as you mentioned, you are so familiar with so much of the current state of manufacturing sort of uh, on a global scale. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't see a lot of infrastructure personally available to do wide scale, you know, domestic denim production. Um, but I'd be interested to hear what, what you have to say. <laughs> well, and I, I, and I have not really insights in exactly that. And I'm, I'm, I mean, reshoring is also what kind of labor is it that we're getting back? It's, I mean, we have, a, we see so more and more of, you know, I mean, optimization of all forms of labor. And the question is how many work, I mean, how many workers are actually going to be hired? Textile industry traditionally, and in all cases are going for the lowest possible salaries. So perhaps, yes, I mean, if they reshore, that will not necessarily be the most well-paid jobs that are coming back to, to, to whichever economy they, they come to. So, so I think it's, 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 um, the textile industry is always tricky in that sense because mm -hmm. it has always being in the forefront of technological innovation of so many ways, but also of labor exploitation traditionally. So, so I'm not too sure that we should celebrate the return of that kind of labor anyway. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean I, 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 that brings to mind sort of also just like the struggles with promoting kind of local, a, a local clothing economy kind of full stop. You know, James said that this all started as being a very kind of local way like clothing being a very kind of local endeavor whereas now obviously that's not the case and we've seen sort of with trying to bring just garment production full stop back to new york how difficult and trying and how connected it is to consumer habits and price points and the issue that you brought up out of labor and what people are going to get paid to do this kind of work that it, it's not as simple as we want to do it in theory and therefore we should or can. But, at the same time, but we could imagine that, that actually denim could be at the forefront coming back again to the question mm. of care. That the question, I mean, we do see more and more jeans brand, especially leading the way for, for repairs in the stores and actually hiring people to do repairs in the store as part of their branding in that sense. And I think we see more and more, I mean, even now I know in, in Scandinavia, H&M are starting mm. to have repair shops in some of their sort of flagship stores, the way you can hand in sort of any clothes to be repaired. And I think just that little aspect, which could change consumer behavior in the sense that we, how we treat garments as being not really, I mean, it's too costly to replace a zip or too costly to do anything basically, because the price, price points of garments have been so cheap that we have no culture of care at all any longer within the broader mm -hmm. consumer. Um, segments. So I think that's where perhaps the denim could once again, if you want to say so, uh, in a sense be teaching us something about being with clothes in that sense. That just, yeah. Thank you all. So I want to spend the last 10 or so minutes um, addressing some of the questions that we've gotten from our listeners. Uh, one that I think is particularly compelling is for the whole panel, why are jeans not considered professional in attire? Um, or in, in a professional setting, and is it a class? Is it a class issue? I mean, I would say that that's not always true. I think it depends on your industry. You know, there's plenty of sectors. I think, particularly in more kind of creative sectors or tech, where people are wearing jeans, even in the most you know, kind of high-powered situations. You know, obviously they're not considered kind of what a lawyer going to court is going to wear or what you expect to see in a boardroom, which I assume is what we're really talking about. But generally across the board, there has been a sort of to make up a word, casualization of business attire that jeans are very much a part of. Um, but I, I do think that the, the reservation to bring it into these other very um, kind of codified spaces of business attire does, I think, have to do not just with class, but all of the cultural associations that have become attached to genes. 
you know, whether it's workwear or it's, you know, the rebellious motorcycle gang or the rock group that all of these play in. And I'm sure James has a lot more insight on that. You said it, but I mean, yes, I mean, this, the, the prison, the, you know, the uh, prison uniforms, I mean, there's so many touch points over the cent over the century plus, but you're right. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of Steve Jobs, you know, wearing uh, jeans and his black turtleneck, right? I mean, that was his unit, that was his uniform. And, uh, you know, there was hardly uh, another person so um, well established in the, in the corporate world uh, than he was when he was alive. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, um, it's inter it is interesting to sometimes come across, you know, places in New York City where you still can't wear jeans to a, you know, an upscale uh, uh, restaurant or whatever, because that that in itself is a little bit um, shocking when you come across it because it's like, really, that's still happening, <laughs> you know. I mean, also just coming into sort of culture change, because of course, exactly, there has been a huge culture and a change in the way that we perceive jeans and exactly you can get away wearing it in so many workplaces today and I think you know coming back to the question of sustainability that you know if if we could possibly also twist the the culture of wearing full suit to your workplace and actually being able to push for wearing shorts in summer at workplaces which would you know the possibility of, of just having the ACs go up just a few degrees the, you know, the temperature of workplaces would have a huge impact on the <laughs> on sort of the energy cost of this whole country. Uh, you know, so, so I think, you know, in the sense of how genes actually be has able to change its position in culture and become a sort of a garment that could be worn in, in other places could also in a sense be hopeful in the sense that we could also change to more sustainable dressing practices that would not be so, you know, environmentally cumbersome for, for the, you know, indoor, uh, um, climate and the contrast between indoor and outdoor. That was just a short observation. Sorry. <laughs> I agree with you. And I'm Canadian, so I have no problem with the Canadian tuxedo either. Um, OK, so one more question. I might sneak in a last one. Um, if all jeans are made with cotton, which most are, um, whether or not they have stretch, how can we determine the difference between low quality and high quality jeans? What's the, is there an easy way to determine that difference? Um, does anyone want to touch on this? I mean, I, I <laughs> there's so many different axes on how someone is going to define quality that it's hard to just pin something down. I mean, traditionally, the way that you're talking, like the, the in the denim industry, the way that this and Tara, you can also jump in and touch on this a lot because you are the one here who's worked in the denim industry. But it's my understanding that it has it has to do with weight. It has to do with where the cotton's coming from. It has to do with what looms it's being made on. Um, but obviously we see that, you know, when we're talking about that in the denim industry, where you see brands like Capital or Avisu or all the, these Japanese companies and Scandinavian companies that are really into these stats about the denim, that's how they talk about quality. But then when you go to, uh, you know, Dior or even, you know, a recently now in trouble J Crew or Madewell, you know, they will talk about denim in a different way. Um, what I have found interesting is that in recent years, really at in a 21st century setting, it's been interesting to see that Japan or Japanese has become a catchword for quality in denim you know, which I think is interesting given how we were talking about kind of American jeans being this sort of status or cool factor or, you know, product that was wanted that now almost whatever level of the market you go to, you know, whether you're at a more high street store like Madewell or you're at a high end, you know, rag and bone or going up to a Dior that they'll talk about a Japanese made denim. 
Yeah, and I will add to that because I do remember when I was working in sourcing denim, the company I was working for was sourcing a lot of its denim from Italy and Japan. And the Japanese mills we were working with were actually using vintage Levi's looms that they had bought because they were no longer being used here in the United States, which is tragic, but at least they're being put to good use. And there was a, an attention to detail um, and especially attention to quality in those manufacturers that had persisted, which I thought was great. So we only have time for one last question and I'm gonna leave it with a lighthearted one um, to say goodbye to everybody is this last audience question is, what is your personal favorite je pair of jeans that you've ever worn and why? Uh, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, ha I had a pair of Levi's from high school that I probably wore until I was 30 something, uh, miraculously still fit into them. I would never come close to fitting into them today, but um, they were so, there was like more leg than fabric by the time I was done with them. They were like, you know, the thighs, the, you know, I had to patch the crutch, you know, the, the back pockets, you know, they were just, it was just, they were full of holes and, you know, it was kind of, after a while, it sort of became a point of pride to just kind of keep them chugging on, uh, uh, keep them alive somehow um, until I outgrew them. <laughs> um, my, I guess, dirty little secret as a, someone on this panel is that I don't really wear jeans that often. <laughs> um, the, the reality is that, or the unfortunate fact about a lot of denim for women is, you know, I unfortunately kind of came of age, uh, you know, right around 2000 when really low rise jeans were very in. And as someone who has a, you know, any kind of hips, it, they just really didn't work very well for me. It was always a struggle to find anything that was going to fit or work or anything. And so I kind of eventually sort of gave up on them um, and, and liked other types of denim garments, like a, a, a jacket or a pair of overalls or something like that. Um, but I will say that that being said, um, I have through all my research, you know, really come back more into denim and been more interested. So recently I've started wearing jeans more and, um, Interestingly, Everlane, I think, is a very good company um, in this space. In terms of a lot of the issues we're talking about with sort of sustainability, transparency, things that are happening, um, and they make a good pair of jeans. But my dirty secret is I've always struggled with them, which is probably why I find them so fascinating. <laughs> I think, I mean, being a younger brother, I had a lot of hand-me-downs, and I think I always had a sort of a struggle with the patched look of that and the stigma in a sense that perhaps I didn't necessarily had experience, but I felt in a sense that, um, and it took some time to get over that. And it was a pair of jeans in, in, at the end of high school that sort of, that sort of became a way by which I could once again, sort of reclaim a repaired look, if you want to say so, or, or get over with that. I could have, you know, patched up stuff, uh, having patches in the crotch was not a stigma. You know, it could actually be something that could have a little coolness to it. And I think exactly that, thanks to those genes that, that you know, I, 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 it was a sort of an entry point to sustainable behavior, if you want to say so to me. And I think that are still why I, I cannot wear them now. I mean, they, they disappeared long ago, but it was sort of, I have a romantic memory of them as being this kind of entry drug into, into sustainable behaviors. <laughs> I love it. And I did not know this question was coming, but I did come prepared. I recently got this pair of Everlane jeans on Poshmark, so they're secondhand. Um, they're made in a fair trade denim factory and they were ripped. So I'm repairing them with some of my textile scraps. So there you go. That's my little show and tell portion. I love it. You brought it, you brought it all together. I brought it together. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I learned a lot today and I hope our audience did too. So I really appreciate you being here um, and I wish you a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.